Good evening, friends. My name is Kristen Pitts, and I'm the Bread and Roses Coordinator at Trinity Episcopal Church here in Charlottesville. We are excited to have y'all join us this evening for our water bath canning workshop. I want to start off by welcoming you and also sharing a few housekeeping items. Tonight, we will be canning tomatoes and peaches. While the presenter is speaking, we ask that you keep yourself on mute. As our workshop leader walks us through the process, you are welcome to place questions in the chat box. Throughout tonight's workshop, there will be times when the presenter will invite participants to unmute and ask questions. During these times, please keep your questions to under two minutes to give others an opportunity to ask questions as well. So tonight's presenter doesn't really need an introduction. She is a legend and woman of many talents. A California native, she has had a career as a folk singer, a member of the cast of the musical Hair, and at one time catered to movie crews when she started a Somali business. She farmed for eight years in South Dakota and earned her master's and PhD from William & Mary. Retired from six years as an African-American research historian at Monticello, she lectures and writes on issues of food history and teaches rural life skills like canning, baking, and cookery from her farmstead Indico House in Western Albemarle County. I will now pass the mic to our workshop leader, Lenny Sorensen. Thank you. Welcome. Welcome to you all. I hope you can hear me. I've got to move down and give me so this is a very, for a lot of people, it seems complicated, but it's actually a very simple process. We're going to start with peaches and jars. I'm going to give you a quick uh, notion of the tools that you uh, might want to use as you uh, prepare to perhaps can for the first time. And so there's various, here's our jars. We place a lot of kinds of jars. We've got white metal jars, skinny metal jars. White mouth pipe jars, so white mouth pork. I choose white mouth because it's just easiest to have everything all be the same. But you might end up with a big belly of some of these brown jars, and they're all going to be narrow neck, and you might as well go with them. But what's nice about is that with the narrow neck jars, it fits forks. The narrow neck fits all of the jelly jars. So we're currently looking for a few of these. Some jelly or some little condiments. I know a lot of people are making maybe a lot of what they call a cowboy can these days in little jars. There, all the little fiddle decorative jars for Christmas presents. They all fit. And they'll come uh, always, these jars, in boxes of 12 with their little lids. So you don't need, the first time you do it, you don't need to buy new lids. You've got them all set. So those are just some examples of jars that you can have. I've got some, uh, some, just some examples of things that I can, just to give you a sense of the range of things you could even think about canning. I got, um, I think it was three really cheap pineapples. This is last year. And I wanted to do something with them. You could eat three pineapples all at once. And so I canned them. A little, a little sugar water and pineapples, and boy, are they really tasty. And I got them so cheap that it was a really good deal. I already had the jars. Um, I have a pear tree in my yard, and we harvest the pears, and they make really luscious, uh, sweet pears. For tomatoes, I had a big um, vat of tomatoes that, oh, I don't know, I just decided I think I'm going to make a nice thick tomato concentrate. Uh, and so that's what I did. I cooked it down and that's what's in this, this jar for use for making, I don't know, chili, uh, that kind of thing. This is a, one of those really interesting, beautiful kinds of jars that you can buy that are especially for jams and jellies. And a lot of people use them for apple butter. This is orange marmalade, but we have. And then this is some lemon marmalade that I, that I made. But there's all these different things that you can think about for water bath canning because water bath canning is for high acid foods. It's for tomatoes, it's for uh, 
fruit with sugar. It's for things that use sugar, salt, and vinegar. And with those things, you can reassure yourself that you have high acid enough uh, to do your canning and have it be safe when cooked in the water bath, which is gonna cook for, or it's gonna process for anywhere from 15 minutes for a tiny jar of jams all the way to 35 minutes for tomatoes or for peaches. You have to, um, you have to time that and it's 35 minutes from the time the water that it's in comes to a boil. And I'll, I'll show you all that. So we're gonna start with peaches and uh, today, the thing that has to happen with peaches is they have to be blanched. And blanching means we're going to take the skins off. And now we're going to do that and peel that. And so someone's going to make me that ice water they promised me. And I'm going to put peaches in the blanching water, which is just boiling water. Again, you got to be careful. There's always splashes. They don't have to blanch long. What you're doing is you're heating up the skin to get it to loosen. And then when it hits that ice water, it really release. Also cools them down enough that you can handle them. And let's see here, we've got that, 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 and that. And I'm gonna put this kind of, this peach that's a little, a little ripe. I want to put it in there too because I want to show you. You know, sometimes you get fruit and it's just not always the most fantastic fruit that that that's available. But you're going to use it in honestly past perfection. None of it has to be perfection. I'm going to roughly time this. Splanching. I'm watching this one there. Go. You see that it's um, the peel is just it's coming right off. See how that's doing with that? Okay, so that means that that's uh, that's that, that's done. It's always nice to have full rolling boil. Always pretty much, ooh, that's gonna be great. I always love to go and have, ever since I was a kid, to go to the county fair or the state fair, if you're ever so fortunate, and go to the, the big uh, demonstrations of all the canned goods and the wonderful vegetables that people have grown and see all the beautiful jars and stuff. And, you know, when you go, you can get very enthused, but you don't want to be a perfectionist about what you're doing. What I'm teaching is you've got some peaches that somebody gave you or that you were able to get at a good price, and you want to get them in jars. They're not going to be county fair peaches. They're going to be good peaches that you can serve for your family, have for your table, make smoothies out of, make peach cobbler, whatever it is you need to do can do that. I want you to show, if you would, down here, this container of, um, well, it looks like water, but it's sugar water. And I'll tell you the proportion in just a minute, but you want to have the sugar water be hot. And that's what I'm doing now, making that. It doesn't have to boil, boil. It just has to really be hot, scalding hot, and you have to dissolve the sugar. It's really good. And we're going to go I'm not fancy. What I want to do is get the, peach, the, the, the skin off the peach. So I start at the bottom of the peach and I peel it all the way down. Peel it all the way down. Peel it down. Can we 
you see, sometimes there's a little bruise spot, just cut on past that, you'll be fine. But you can just see how beautiful that peach looks when it's been, when it's been peeled. Every peach has that crease that goes from the stem end all the way to the top. There's this crease in it. And if you cut, cut right along that crease, all the way around that peach, and then just kind of rock your knife, ta-da, you got peach. Now, what I really do need to have is some cold water, a little bit of cold water. Oh, I got a clever clam woman here. She knows what she's doing. She's got me. That's, that's about all I need. Okay. What I'm going to do, you know how when you cut things like apples or you cut peaches and they get brown from oxid oxidation when they're cut. Well, you can buy in the store a product called Fruit Fresh. What it's actually is made of is citric acid. It's very, very simple, very inexpensive. Now, if you decide to really can a lot, the neat thing is just buy a bunch, buy a big thing and it'll last you forever. I am told that here at Trinity, they have received a five gallon pail of citric acid, which is enough to can hundreds, hundreds of quarts of peaches, which is just wonderful. So let's let's give them a, a so I'm gonna put about this is roughly a tablespoon. Ta -da! That's all it needs. Just gonna put this in here so that as I cut up my peaches. And for canning, I want them about this size. That would make a pretty pie, make a pretty galette. It would make uh, beautiful on top of a piece of cake. Uh, but you can just mush it right up into a smoothie if that's what you'd like. But you start off with, a, with the biggest usable size that's useful to you. You can always make it smaller. I'm having fun today because I'm working in this kitchen that's totally new to me. So if I seem a little slow, it's not like I'm working at home, but so forgive me. Again, we're just gonna start at the bottom end of the peach and slowly peel it down. And there's nothing as beautiful as the color of, these, of the peach, that, that beautiful, beautiful color. That's what makes it fun every year. Even when you've got a whole bushel of peaches staring at you in the face, each one's gonna be really pretty. Okay. Now this one you see has a little bit of a bruise on it. I'm not gonna worry about that. I'm going to just cut it off. I'm gonna cut it off this side. If there's any little bruise that you don't like, cut off, you're fine. Like I say, we're not in this for perfection. We're in it to have good food that has been processed with love at home or with a group of people in a community kitchen, working together to have um, peaches come the winter time, which is always, usually when I do peaches, I try to use as many fresh as I can. And then the canned ones I save till uh, usually Thanksgiving. That's a nice time to bring out a jar of peaches and, uh, and do something with them. Like I say, some of these, when I buy peaches, I buy them, um, I buy seconds. You can speak to your farmer's market or your orchard, your orchard person near you. These are good relationships to make, to have uh, uh, with people who farm and who raise fruit, uh, to let them know that you wouldn't that you wouldn't mind buying seconds. They're not the most beautiful, uh, but they are often less expensive. So they make a very good, a very good deal to have. Oh, someone's being very, very, and I'm gonna protest. Leave my garbage alone. I like to have my garbage right there in front of me. 
okay, I am not, we don't want to need, need to use any more dishes than we need to use. We got enough stuff going on. Unless you got somebody in your house that loves to wash dishes, you need to just, you know, straighten it up. It's already, your counter's already dirty. Not dirty, but just, you know, sticky. So you might as well let it be sticky. So here we go. And you can see with, with willing hands and uh, you just pull that pit right out. This comes right out. Now see how there's a little bit of that stem? I'm gonna just cut that out. So fine. Now we're just cutting our peaches. I mean, this little bruise here, I'm gonna take that out. I mean, if you think this is casual, wait till you see these tomatoes. By goodness, we're just gonna start chunking the tomatoes really fast. Now this is a gorgeous peach and I'm hoping to be able to show you something. Yeah, it's, if the peaches are too, not quite ripe enough, they don't peel easily. This doesn't mean you can't use them, but you can see that kind of greenish spot there. That's not gonna peel real easy. So I'm just gonna cut right through that. So peaches need to be, and most fruit, you wanna have it just right not too ripe and not too green uh, to can the very best. There we go. Now, all of you, I hope that are interested and wanna pursue these things, will get the ball canning book. Uh, I see they're available, even used on Amazon. The 37th edition, the brand new edition, or the newest edition, is wonderful. What's wonderful about those books is that they give you all the most current, up-to-date, researched uh, material on canning times, on processes, uh, processing time, on how to treat the fruit, plus lots and lots of really wonderful recipes for what you want to, uh, what you might want to make, salsas and jams. And, you know, we're doing the absolute simplest thing you can do to a peach, which is just cut it up, put it in a jar. Ah, here's one of those green ones. See how that was? I'm gonna just take that green right off. I'm not gonna fight with it. The peaches can make, uh, you know, you can make, ooh, I made peach mango salsa one year. Oh, so good. Um, you can, well, when you have a whole bushel of, bushel of peaches, half the time, you're so doggone tired by the time you get done, you just want to get these damn peaches in jars. And if they're already cut up, see how this has got a spot in it? We're just gonna, we're not, we're just gonna cut around that spot. We're not gonna worry about that. That's not gonna hurt anything because remember the processing for all of this is gonna be in sugar water with, in a boiling water bath at 212 for 30 minutes, which is the process of time. So let's see what we can do here. There we go. There we go. And I don't, I leave all of that in. It just adds a flavor to the peaches. I think it makes them look beautiful. It certainly doesn't hurt anything. That's just the residue of where the pit lies in the peaches. I kind of stir it up a little bit just to help keep the peaches from getting off, from getting brown. Now this is an interesting batch of peaches because I, I'm finding that the big ones are the greener ones and the smaller ones are the riper ones. But that's okay. You use what you have and that's what's really nice about getting seconds or if you know somebody that has a tree and they let you pick some, that's one of the most wonderful opportunities that you could get. Uh, working with, um, there are orchards who allow people to come and glean the fruit off the ground because, now I'll show you here is a, here is a spot. We're gonna cut all of that off just to make absolutely sure that that's gone. But you can go uh, and you have to call and find out whether they allow it. Um, most orchards 
they cannot pick the fruit up off the floor, even if it is good fruit, if it has fallen from the tree and hit the ground, they can't do anything with it. So they often will be very grateful to have cleaners come and pick the fruit up. And in that context, you'll get some bruised fruit, of course, but you're gonna get a lot of really good fruit too. You just have to, uh, you know, check through it all. Uh, it's not going to be uh, injured in any way, really. Uh, some of it might just be extra ripe, in which case you're going to have a lot of peach jam. And part of how we're assuring that our peaches are absolutely safe is that they are fruit and we are using citric acid um, to as part of the staff, but mostly we're canning them in sugar. And if you need to can in sugar of some sort, whether it's a very light sugar sauce, uh, because otherwise when the peach is in the jar, if you use just plain water, the water would pull the sugar out of the peach. I think it's called hydrostatic action. That's the very fancy name for it. And you don't want that. You want the, the, the sweetness to stay in the fruit. And so you need to have some kind of sugar water. Some people might use a little honey, but actually sugar and honey are all the same thing. You're not going to hurt you. You don't need to use much. Okay. I say, for me, this beautiful, that part, that, that peachy, gorgeous color. That's one of my favorite colors. I'd wear it every day if I could find something that was that color. Let's see. I think we're going to be enough here. Point. Remember, this is just a demonstration, folks. This isn't, if you came and canned at my house, we'd be canning all day. We'd can four or five canners worth of peaches. You'd end up with, well, my canner holds eight uh, quarts, holds uh, not, or nine pints. So times three, four, you know, we could have a whole lot of peaches done in a day. We're just gonna do a small amount tonight, just to give you a sense of that it's not hard. There, we got peaches. You're cut, you're ready, you're ready uh, to go. Into, into, into jars. I'm going to you're going to give me a, I'm just going to slide this over here. And oh, I'm Bring me four jars um, and we'll see how many they fill. They will fill three, let's see. So your jars are washed. I wash my jars the morning before I'm gonna use everything. I fill my dishwasher with jars and I run it on hot and then I just leave them in there. You know, they stay warm and they're ready to go. There's no they don't have to be sterilized. They're going to cook in this boiling water bath and there's no need to sterilize things. The lids that we always used to hear about boiling the lids, the ball people have changed the formula for the rubber gasket that goes around the inside of the lid to make it so that it really only needs to just be warm. So let's see about Kind of improvising here, but I think you'll understand. Okay, so I'm making with some very hot water and a little bit of ice, just some warm water. And I'm going to, when I get ready to can, and I, I take my lids and my rings 
and I, they've been uh, washed, usually in a, in a bowl. I stack them in the bowl and I put this soap in there and I walk them run them through and I rinse them and then I leave them in hot water. So this is what they are now, they're in this hot water. And that just kind of helps open up that seal a little bit. And then our master tool, which is the funnel. If you don't have one in your kitchen for all of the purposes that you need, including putting oil in your car, if you ever should have to put oil in your car, um, don't let your children have this, by the way. They, they will do dangerous and terrible things with your funnels. Buy them their own funnels. Better yet, have them buy their own funnels. We're going to, using our hands, because my hands are clean, Notice I'm shaking it down a little bit just to get it, get it in here. Good. Oops, sorry. Okay, that's not enough in there. Whether it's pints or quarts, you're going to leave an inch of headroom, and I'm going to show you an inch of headroom. See how fast that goes? We've been doing this in pints, but it had four pints. So there's, we have two quarts. I didn't count how many pieces that was. We could go back and count it, and we'd know. I don't know how many I took out of the, out of the thing. Uh, and, uh, there, and there we have that. Okay, so I'm gonna put these right here for a minute because the next big thing that I'm gonna do is in fact we're gonna give you two more jars, two more jars, under cutter, another jar and two more lids. And I'm gonna move this. I'm trying to do this so that we have enough time to talk if we need to and not just take up time um, doing all of this. Okay, I need my, need my maters. And they've been washed and done. And by the way, I believe that um, Trinity has a, um, a PDF, however they want to uh, uh, share it of my uh, kind of handbook. It's got my uh, email address and all that stuff uh, on it as well. But back in, as we were saying, nothing has to be perfect. We are dealing with, we got a lot of tomatoes and they got a lot of tomatoes and we're gonna do, we wanna use all of these tomatoes up, however it is we use it. We got the bounty of all this fruit. So here's the tomato that obviously got a little sun scald on it. And I'm not going to worry too much about that. I'm going to just cut that part off. Ta -da. And I'm going to make, thank you. Oh, I screwed it up. Okay. I'm going to do what I call chunking tomatoes. Okay, it's the easiest way. And I do it this way for a, for a special reason. Most of the time I'm using tomatoes that I grew or that I know who grew them. I knew how they were grown and where they were grown. Uh, that's kind of what. So I am not, once they're washed, I am not worried about them being dirty or anything like that. They're, they're good, wonderful vegetables. And I don't care about the skins. I have a blender and I can pour up skins when I want to. And the skins have plenty of food value. Why should I waste? This isn't to say that you can't blanch a tomato. People do all the time. I think it's an, when it comes to canning, it's an extra job that does not need to be done. Um, but for something real, real fancy, a fresh raw tomato salad, you might want to do that. But the thing is we have to watch for is using the right kind of tomatoes to can. You will notice, and let me show you here this, these are all plum tomatoes. 
These are tomatoes specially uh, uh, grown, uh, uh, cultivated to be paste tomatoes. San Marzano's, Roma's, uh, there's probably some other names, uh, but they're usually bright red, they're a little tart. You can use good slicing tomatoes, nice bright red firm tomatoes. The very beautiful heirloom tomatoes that people are growing and that are available at the farmer's market, these beautiful purple, the Cherokees and the Germans and all, they are so lovely sliced fresh and eaten fresh on a salad and uh, you know just out of can, but they, are, they tend to be low acid. And so you're gonna find me a half a teaspoon measuring spoon if you can. A half teaspoon measuring measuring spoon um, is that the new preservation method, just to make absolutely sure, because so many tomatoes have been in the last while bred to be a little, a little less acid, so that people really will enjoy just eating them fresh. Is that they um, want to? We're going to make sure by putting citric citric acid into our tomatoes. And that's all it is, it's like vitamin C. It just holds them, adds that little bit of acid. Tomatoes are high acid. So what I've said is, I'm gonna have skins in my tomatoes. I'm gonna have seeds in my tomatoes. I'm gonna cut off any yucky parts that I don't want. I have chickens, so the chickens are always thrilled when it's tomato time, because then they get all of the stuff that's left. Um, but we're going to chunk tomatoes because that's how I do it to do it fast and get it done. Is as you can see, here's the, you know, but look inside. That tomato is not spoiled inside. We can take that out. There we go. Got a perfectly good, fine tomato there. So we don't waste anything. I was just reading that an astounding amount of American food is wasted every year between the field, the processor, the, the uh, grocery store, and the table. Uh, the, the, one of the biggest items that is thrown away is dairy, dairy items. So I would say we all need to be particularly alert and milk uh, to, uh, to try not to waste our dairy products uh, that way. Now, as you can see, these tomatoes are, are very, all the rest of these don't have any blemishes. I'm gonna just cut off the tops. I'm gonna cut them in pieces. And I'm gonna cut it down, chunk it, chunk in these tomatoes. The, um, there's a certain amount of general vegetable matter, of course. There's, you know, those lettuces that we forget in the bottom of our refrigerator. Um, and we need to, with a world that is hungry, we need to be careful. And it's not just Americans. I'm not trying to just pick on us. It's worldwide, this is a crisis. Many places, they harvest crops, but then they don't have good places to store those harvested crops before they get shipped out to other places. And so they essentially get, become spoiled at the dock before they even get shipped to where they're gonna go. So astounding amounts of uh, important good food is wasted. And in my own little way, when it comes to what I grow in my garden, which takes a lot of effort every year to grow a lot of tomatoes, I don't want to waste any of it if I can possibly help it. Even though I do have the chickens, it will help me with cut with the slack end of it. But food wastage is something that should concern uh, all of us. Bread is a, another very high item that gets wasted, and which is one of the reasons that it's really great if people can learn to bake their own bread so that they can uh, bake it in smaller amounts so they can bake it more often and get it all eaten before it spoils. So, and as you can see, I'm not using cutting boards. I just have my favorite knife. I'm just using my hands. Again, my hands are clean. Uh, I'm not worried about. Uh, when I'm canning, I'm in my own kitchen that is clean. 
that I that I use all the time that I make for food. And I think we all are that. We have a certain idea. We know the cleanliness of our kitchen. We're not going to drop anything on the floor. You know, there's no three second rules when it comes to panning stuff. If it drops on the floor, throw it out. But here we go. Let's see what we can do with this. So here I've got chunks of tomatoes. I might stand and do a whole half a bushel of tomatoes chunked with the big bowl so I know I've got them all ready. And I'm gonna start, where's my funnel? I always put the citric acid in after. You can put it in first, I don't care. Now it doesn't need to be rinsed, just have peaches in it. Girl, what have I been telling you? You don't need to waste water. That's the other thing. I mean, think of all the water that people didn't have. Why it is this whole canning thing is really kind of new because 150 years ago, many of our great grandmothers and uh, grandmothers, they didn't have running water. Um, it was a hell of a, a job to do almost any kind of cookery that they had to do just to have enough clean dishes. So I squished my tomatoes in and you'll find that the juicier tomatoes do this a little faster, but I just push them in with my hands so that as they go, begin to see the juice coming up. See the juice coming up? I want to push them in enough that it's making its own juice. And one of the reasons I like doing it that way is. When this, I don't want to add any extra water so that when these tomatoes are done, all the juice that's in is from just the tomatoes that are in this jar. There's no extra water. So you've got all the, the good juice uh, from, from the tomatoes. I'm going to have to chunk a few more tomatoes. It looks like Look at that. We've got almost a whole. Um, Do we want to take a little get to see if there's any questions? Are there any questions at this point? If not, let's. If you have questions, you're invited to unmute yourself at this time. Lenny, I think you said, but um, what what's the difference between the plum tomatoes and like the beefsteak tomatoes? Would you do it the same way, chunk them? Yeah, uh -huh. uh, the, the larger, those beefsteaks, early girls, better boys, all of them, they're just juicier. They're just, a, they're, just they're, they're just a juicier, bigger, not quite as dry. These San Marzano's and all were perfected in order to easily make sauce. Um, uh, you know, because there's not as much water in them. They're a drier tomato. But you can make sauce with any tomato. You just might have to cook it a little longer than you, um, you know, if you had fresh tomatoes and you wanted to make some, some fresh tomato sauce, and if they all you have, if what you have is beefsteak, cook them, do it. And if they're just going to be a little juicier, you might have to cook it a little longer. Some people feel the, um, you know, sometimes it has to do with the ease. Some, some, some kinds of plants grow better in certain areas. Um, ease of picking, seasonality, uh, when things come in and, and are available for the canneries and for large you know, production. But all of your home, you can can cherry tomatoes. Just can all your cherry tomatoes. Just put them in with everything else. Um, and those I don't even usually, I just wash those, throw them in whole, um, mush them up with the regular tomatoes because they're what? They're tomatoes. <laughs> and what about green tomatoes? Do they can? Uh, that's a different process. Then you're usually talking something like green tomato marmalade something that's seasoned. Um, most of us 
I can't think of a use, unless you were going to use it for like green tomato salsa, you could use it for, you could use green tomatoes for. Um, I use, I've made uh, green tomato marmalade, both sweet and uh, savory. And it's nice. You just have to like that flavor, you know. Um, well, there's a lot of old fashioned, um, old 19th century recipes for green tomato marmalade. And they're um, really, and, and, and it can be very tasty. I don't, um, mostly for me, it's fried green tomatoes all the way. Maybe there was someone who emailed a question in advance. Mm -hmm. She asked, is it okay to have recipes? Um, for example, with tomato sauces, is it okay to cut a recipe in half? Oh, absolutely. It just depends on how many jars you want to end up with. So it, uh, that's what's going to happen. If you're going to have half the number of jars. So you might want to think about if it's a recipe that seems to be talking about putting things in quarts, you might want to, um, in your head, divide that into pints and think about, okay, how many pints is that going to be if I make it, if I divide this in half? No. Yes, no, it's, it's uh, because of like I say, it is going to be pure. Here we come back again. Here, come back again here and show me here. Now I'm chunking this in. You see how when I push this down, the liquid comes right up to that inch mark? That's the mark I'm looking for, that inch mark. And I'm going to do things at once here. Go crazy. Give me back my peaches. My peaches give me a uh... now for tomatoes and for peaches, we're going to try to get the bubbles out when we fill the liquid. So we want where's the funnel? Can you see how those bubbles come up the side? So what we're doing is we're displacing all the air in there. So we can pull it this side of the way. We can drop down on the floor. We're aiming to have everything liquid and fruit at one inch. That way, it's, there's less likelihood of it siphoning out or being too full, uh, all of those things. And what we're going to make sure that we get all our bubbles out by see a stick like this. They have a really fancy little plastic one that comes with a canning kit. If you buy a canning kit, that's called a bubbler. And you'll see mine, I already have an inch measured on here. See, so it shows an inch. And what I do is I push it down the side and I pull toward the center. And that makes sure it gets any bubbles that are in there, out of there. And then you look. Remember eyeballs. I don't see any, I don't see any empty voids. I don't see any bubbles. Okay, so that's working for that. Going to add one little. What is that you're putting in? A little bit of the sugar water. I'm just trying to bring it right to one inch. That's my that's my measure. Now, since I know I have my tomatoes at an inch, I'm going to do for each quart of tomatoes. I'm going to put a half teaspoon of citric acid. For the It'll just process it right in there with the tomatoes. Doesn't have to be mixed in, doesn't have to be on the bottom. It's just everybody, that just absolutely ensures that all the, the tomatoes that I, that I use are, the, the whole process is acid, uh, as high an acid as it wants to be. Because for boiling water bath, what we want, let's see, I have a bubble right there. Can you get that on the camera? Let's see if I can get that. 
and that filled it in. Okay, so let's see. There's always going to be some bubbles you just can't get. That's just the way of it. But you want to get most of them because if they're too big, they'll, they'll they can blow the lid, and you want your lids to seal. Um, so you just squish it down the side of your jar. Ah, that was a big one. Yep, now it's full of liquid. Everything is full of liquid. And there we go. Okay, now I made, I've got this hot warm water that my lids are in. And I'm gonna use a clean paper towel. Then I'm gonna wipe the lids, the top of the rim of each jar, excuse me, of each jar just to make sure there's no little pieces of fruit uh, stuck to it. Doesn't matter if it's wet, I don't have to dry it. I just have to just dry it up, wipe it off. Okay, now. As you see, when I put this on here, I haven't handled the lid. The lid is, is basically, you know, kind of hands-free. And I'm gonna put it on and I'm gonna screw it on what's called fingertip tight. See where it's here? I'm gonna put it there. Now, if I showed it to you, I have to back it off a little bit. And what it's doing, of course, is just really holding the lid onto the jar. It is not making the seal. You make it too tight, then when you try to undo it, the next day after it's cool, you can break the seal trying to get that break. So you don't wanna do that. So fingertip tight is, is the, the phrase. Now, back in 100 and so years ago, when very poor farm women, rural women, um, we were still really largely a rural place, um, they who didn't have, uh, may have had some gardens, but didn't have the water, the money to buy jars, all the other things that you need to have, a big stove, the fuel, think of all the fuel you have to have to be able to have all this stuff going. That's when they started the extension office um, community canning kitchens. One of the most wonderful, wonderful things uh, to, to really come out of uh, the uh, Depression era, uh, Roosevelt era, is to have all of these wonderful canneries that families could come together and bring all their green beans or their tomatoes or whatever and can them all together uh, in that setting. It was just fantastic and in the fall they could do it with their venison or their pork or uh, you know to the to ensure that they had really good food homemade homegrown home process uh, food for the uh, for the winter so we're going to move a little bit take it from this little hot so I'm going to turn off this one this this actually this is off okay this is one okay this is the panel, and I'm going to I like to put them balanced. A little tippy. There they go. And then let's see what it is. So. Oh, 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 my goodness gracious, my water has boiled away, and I'm going to use this blanching water, which won't make any difference, in order to bring the water two inches above the top of the lid. You can get quite kind of boiled away doing all the time of me talking to all y'all. I love all you all, but it's really hard to both talk and do at the same time. Just let me know. Okay, now this is covered with two inches of hot water. Uh, I'm going to put a lid on it. And when it comes to a full rolling boil, <laughs> Thank you. 
then I'll time it. My particular tanner is a style that has a gauge, which is particularly helpful for people who live at different altitudes because you have to boil things at different altitudes. And so I'll be watching for it to hit the green line for our altitude. Uh, but a regular can, come over here. It has just a rack that holds eight jars or six jars, whatever. They come in different sizes. What you want to watch for is you put your lid on, you put your jars in, and then you want to kind of check and you'll see the steam kind of coming out from the edges. And you know, okay, she's got a bowl of oil. Tip it up. Oh, yep, she's going. Then you time. That's when you time. So that's what we're waiting for. And we have our last bit of kit, which is just one of those wonderful tools that you might see sometime in, in, a, in a, a drawer at your grandma's house, your great grandma's house, or some yard sale or auction. You can say, what the hell is that? And you have no idea. And what it is, of course, is a jar lifter. And that's how we're going to get these hot jars out of that rack onto a nice part of the rack. Actually, dry the shower buttons from over here um, when, when they're done uh, so that they can. You want to take them out and put them not in a draft, but on a, on a surface that isn't cold, um, and let them sit for 24 hours till they're really room temp. Then you'll find, you'll either hear the sound of the pop of the lid sealing. Sometimes you don't hear it, it's just, but it is by tomorrow, you'll know. And then you're gonna take the rings off. I rinse my rings and I save them in a paper bag. Um, and there you've got your nice, fresh sealed tomatoes or peaches. Now, we talk about what are you then gonna do Oh, look at that. Okay. What's the bell? Yes. Okay. Time. Somebody got their timer thing? Yeah. 30, 30 minutes. So we have time. Um, you've got these nice jars. Well, hopefully the first time you ever do it, you're so damn proud that you bring everybody over and you heat them up real fast because it's really nice. And that way, you know, you might as well. But if you've made a whole bunch of them, you have to store them. And the secret with storing all uh, pantry goods, canned goods, home canned goods, dry goods, potatoes, uh, rice, bags, all of that stuff is to keep it as cool dry and dark as you can. Sometimes given our apartments and our situations with pretty damn clever about that, but that's our goal. Remember our old, old, old farmhouses, particularly in the Midwest always had um, cellars or, or partial cellars or stairways down to the cellar that they could do all that stuff. And we just don't have that, hardly any of us. We live in apartments. So where's the coolest, driest, darkest place in your house? One maybe that's close to an air conditioning vent. Uh, hopefully it doesn't blow hot air in the wintertime. You have to be careful of that. But uh, where can you put those things? Sometimes maybe it doesn't mean that they're going to store for a long, long time. They're not going to store 10 weeks, 15 weeks like they might in some settings. But at least you know that you could buy five pounds of potatoes, keep them cool, dry, and dark and that you might be able to have them uh, for several weeks without them spoiling or sprouting too bad, that kind of thing. But particularly with canned but you want to keep them dry and dark for several reasons. It helps make sure that it keeps the seal good. It keeps the, the food, uh, food value because it's not exposed to light. And um, it's just the best way to preserve it because you're going to be able to now, the blue book, they're going to tell you what's the shelf life of these things. And they almost always are running these days 18 months. And that seems like a long time. But actually, many of us canners, we have stuff that we've had three and even five years. Again, it comes with experience, knowing what the food is, knowing how it's been stored, 
how it's been checked regularly to make sure I go through and I'm gonna, I'm gonna reach down here and show you. This jar is sealed and how do I know it? Well, I could tell this the same way I'm gonna tell, someone's gonna tell tomorrow on these peaches. See how I can almost lift it up by the lid? I don't wanna do it too hard, too vigorously, but that's sealed. I know that's sealed. I'm gonna store it with nothing, no ring on it, and I put nothing on top of it, and I'm not gonna stack them, okay, which could break the seal, because when I go through my, my cupboard that has, can, has home canned goods, I can pretty much take my hand and I do it periodically. I do it every day. A couple, three weeks, I'll go through and just rub my hand gently over all the lids. Make sure, because if there was something, just by chance, if there was something that happened to the side, if that lid had somehow the seal had just weakened and broken, that food would spoil. Now, I don't even have spoiled food it's sitting in my cupboard and I want to know about it. And that way I can test it. I always know. I, I mark all my food, what, they, what it is and what date I did it. I place the newest stuff at the back. And I eat the, all the stuff at the front. Those are all habits that as, house, as householders, as kitchen holders, uh, whoever we are, we need to get used to. The whole idea of uh, the wear dates and the uh, expired by dates and all of those, those are really largely totally phony commercial things that have been set up in order to have rotation of uh, produce in the grocery store. So it is for the convenience of the grocery store user. Yogurt will last, a quart of good yogurt will last eight, 10 weeks in the refrigerator if it hasn't been open. I mean, it just does. Um, Mayonnaise, the same. I make my own mayonnaise that lasts for, you know, a month easily. Um, you know, most stuff. So be cautious about where it is. I think hopefully this whole lesson of what we've done is not just to encourage you to learn more and to do some canning, which is really wonderful, but to uh, reduce the fear of food level that has been inculcated for many of us in uh, when it comes to commercial food items and saving our own and doing our own and should I and I see a lot of, of people who uh, in various forums that, I, that I'm a member of and I, I try very hard to encourage people to lock it up don't worry about it this is you know and I see other people encouraging people the same way if I see three posts and if I see a post of somebody who's scared and I see five comments of people saying oh no just better done and do this and this is how I do it I say fine there's people taking care of folks and not uh, letting uh, People get you know terrified of the food they eat. It's it's it is not productive, and it, it slows and halts the conversation about what we're eating. The whole idea that food is scary and frightening, and that, uh, some of it, uh, you know, all of that stuff. A lot of it is uh, it doesn't bear scrutiny. It's one thing, and there's a lot of uh, people, you know, as you always say, follow the money. To whose advantage is it for you to think that about whatever it is? that has now been told you uh, that might have to do with food or health or, uh, or vitamins or gut biota or whatever, you know, people will loosely, if you plumb down through some of those links, they're all gonna lead to somebody who wants your money. And so you wanna stick with organizations like the National uh, Organization on Home Canning, your home, your, your, your uh, extension office to your, to your agricultural universities. And of course, every state has state universities that have these wonderful people that work all of their work lives to make the food really safe, really preserved well, uh, to really produce beautiful varieties of food that can be cut and doesn't get brown or, or cut and doesn't bruise and spoil. Uh, I don't know if you've ever opened a bag of potatoes and you get them home and you open a potato and it's full of black spots on the inside and you just want to scream what the at somebody I usually want to take it back to the store but by that time because I live 16 miles of town I'm too fucking far for go to town and I don't want to go to town and so there you know what I mean I'm just really mad and they're working on 
growing potatoes you don't have that and what a what a marvelous way to not waste food you see because nothing would be worse than to bake a potato and split it open and to find it full of black stuff it's beyond gorky you would never get your kid to ever eat another potato in the world you know what i mean how are we doing on our timing Oh, okay. We're doing fine. Do we have any, any more questions? We do have a question on okay. Zoom. So Jeff asked um, a history question. Oh. In 18th and 19th century, before ball jars, did people can? If so, how? Okay, they did can, uh, uh, not in the way that we do it. They usually used um, crockery, which a lot of us have seen those kinds of crops. We know that people had often a wealthier, the wealthier you were, the more you had access to cool storage, be it an ice house or a spring house. Um, but you would layer your food in the crocks and you would usually use quite a bit of salt or quite a bit of sugar because you really had to preserve it. The recipe that I have from 1770 for making tomatoes for soup uh, has you, it's an all day process. Of course, they're working on a, uh, a hearth cookery. So it's a little, a little um, they're, they're not cooking right over a hot, a hot fire. Uh, the tomatoes have been cut and sliced and layered with, um, uh, layered with salt and then they've been cooked and then they've been put in the crock. Um, and then the whole top of the crock has been covered inside. Remember, remember how I left that headroom in there? It, they were going to do that too. And they were going to use clarified butter to seal that. Okay. Kind of in the way some of us might remember uh, old timey, uh, uh, we had grandmas and grandpas in the middle, in the 50s even, and in the 60s that were making jams and jellies. They were using paraffin to seal those jars. And that's the same thing. They're going to seal out, going to have a food that's full of sugar or full of salt, it's pickles or it's jam. You're gonna put that sealant on top of it. Hopefully it's gonna really stick to that rim. So you want that rim of that jar to be really clean and really uh, hot so that the, the paraffin really stick. It's a very persnickety. I wouldn't can that way. You know what I mean? That's one of the things that, that put me off canning uh, for a long time until I realized, well, I was on a farm and I had so goddamn much food, you know what I mean? That I, I had to learn to can it regardless. But I certainly didn't do jams because that seemed to be, I never knew where the hell to buy paraffin, to tell you the truth. You know what I mean? It just wasn't something really, those are all, those have all been um, uh, 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 negated by the fact that we have these beautiful lids, we have these beautiful jars, we have all these sizes so we can make little tiny jars of jam and they'll seal nice in a water bath and we don't have to worry about it. But yes, um, did you say Jeff? The, um, so people did can uh, fruits that way. They might make a layered, uh, start with the spring, uh, the earliest spring fruit, put a layer, then put a layer of sugar, which, you know, came in big cones and somebody, usually an enslaved somebody, had to pound that into sugar. And then they'd put a layer of that, and then they'd put a pint of brandy. Then they'd put the next fruit, and then the next sugar, and the next brandy, and then by by the time the last fruit, those last, those summer apples would come in, they put those on the top, put that last layer. Sometimes they'd take um, brown paper and uh, wax it with butter and then put it across the top and then tie it. And by this time, it's got so much sugar and so much booze in it, you know, that you, it's, you know the jars are falling off the covers. Um, and of course, by the time it ages, you know, by the time you get to Christmas or, you know, festivity, You've got this beautiful preserved uh, brandied fruit that's just magnificent. And you can still do that. You can still do that. That's not something that's impossible. But that's one of the ways that people say it. When it came to what we would call uh, low acid meats and things like that, much more problematic. One of the reasons I think that so many relishes like chow chow and uh, uh, relishes and jams, so many that you see in the book, in the, in the, uh, the candy books, and the recipe books were ways of having those really low acid items that could be quite dangerous, but when they've got sugar, um, salt, vinegar, they can be preserved. So we have all of those tart, sweet, 
jams and preserves uh, that can be made from veg. Meat uh, often was take butcher fat hog, grind up all that meat, grind up the meat that you weren't going to salt down. Or salting it down as a way of preserving it and then smoking it, right? So you've got that covered, but you've got this ground meat. What are you going to do with it? Well, they would often make it into patties, fairly thin, fry them, not hard, just fry them, stack them in crocks and fill the crock with hot lard, fresh hot lard, to seal all of the gaps, fresh hot lard, seal that in all the way to the top. And when they wanted it, they could reach in and take it out. Now, of course, remember, we don't use as much lard, although lard is quite wonderful for you. But these are people that often, um, more often than not, are burning three and four thousand calories a day. It's very hard labor. They can eat all of the, they can eat all the lard and all the pork that they want, and we need to just shut the hell up about it, you know, because uh, people were really working hard and they could not live on just veg and, and beans. They, they just couldn't. They needed protein, they needed fat. So there were these other ways, but they were always, in, with very few exceptions, they were hard to, uh, uh, for most people to have, the poor, the, the, the lower middling and lower, and people who didn't own land, and people who were landless, and people who were tenant farmers, and people who were enslaved, they didn't have the luxury of all that. So who is it that had those idyllic farm pantries that we love to you know, rhapsodize about, and, and often sometimes well, those were often really quite prosperous middling and upper middling farming uh, uh, families, often in places like Pennsylvania, where they get a cold enough winter that they have cool enough um, celery uh, areas to keep their foods uh, quite chilled and quite you know and cold and ready. Um, and they had spring houses so they could milk their cow and put the milk in the spring house and have it be chilled and have it be dependable. Um, if you didn't have those luxuries, then you didn't have that. Many sharecropping families, especially tenant farmers, they weren't allowed to have a garden. This is a post reconstruction. They had to grow that crop, whatever it was, right up to the walls of their cabins. You can see the pictures from the WPA. Um, so very poor people didn't have access to this stuff, which is, again, when I get back to the 20s and the 30s, um, the, um, the, 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 uh, the land grant universities that of course were first begun by Lincoln. And then as they began to expand what they uh, were offering uh, as, as uh, ag schools and what they do now, they, they test crops. You know, I lived in South Dakota for years and if I was driving between my house and the University of South Dakota at Brookings, which was a 40 mile strip uh, road, um, I might see literally hundreds of test crops spot. They would be maybe, I don't know, 50 feet wide and how, I don't know how many, how deep of 50, 60, 70 kinds of corn, different kinds of soybeans, different kinds of crops, you know? So our extension and our ag universities are fantastic things that what is even more wonderful is they are ours. They are, they are public, publicly owned, and they are resources that, that belong to us. We need to make sure that we avail ourselves of um, the really wonderful people who work for them. Do you have another question? Yes, before we get into the next question, I did just want to comment that the resource guide that I shared actually has um, the contact information for our local extension agent who can provide additional opportunities for education and um, resources around food preservation. Her name is Kim Booker for our area. She's wonderful. She is wonderful. Our next question is a, a second question from Jeff who asks, was it more common to use fermentation for vegetables and fruit than to can them? For those who had fermentation as part of their cultural tradition, yes. I think many Northern Europeans, Germans, Pole, uh, Pole Swedes, Danes, uh, when it comes to preserving uh, pickling veg, uh, particularly root veg and, um, uh, and cabbage in various forms, it, it's, it's wonderful. Again, you know, if you live someplace where it's 102, you know, pretty much 
during the summer and half the bugs got your, you know, you can only put, you can only do cabbage in the spring for about two weeks, you know, that, that means a very different form of, of food waste. Uh, but yes, fermentation was uh, and still is a, a wonderful thing for people to learn. And I know that a lot of more people are really learning it. There's a woman named Julia Skinner who is truly a brilliant uh, exponent of uh, fermentation on all levels, everything from kombucha to, to sauerkraut to just every kind of possible fermentation. If you look her up online, Julia Skinner, you're gonna find her. She's written a couple books and uh, she goes around the country. So these can be really super, super things. They aren't, again, they rely on, um, well, either natural fermentation, if you have the right kind of products and the, the right kind of veg that's gonna do it. Uh, when I make sauerkraut, I use a little bit of salt and that kind of starts that going. I've made pretty successful sauerkraut, although I've made some terrible disasters in sauerkraut that literally the chickens wouldn't eat. And it has to be really, really god awful when the chickens not eat. Uh, and a lot of it has to do with balancing the amounts and the timing and the temperatures and all those things. So it's not just an intuitive, oh my God, I'm going to make myself some pickle, whatever. You got to learn what you're doing. And there are some wonderful sources out there for learning how to do that. So I don't know if there's another question. Is there another? I think I got, I got all of Jeff. Gotcha, Jeff. I have a quick question. Um, other than tomatoes and peaches, what other fruits and vegetables are good to utilize with the water bath canning method? Okay. Pears, plums, grapes, cherries, apricots, should one be so absolutely be incredibly fortunate as to have such a thing as an apricot. I grew up with them in California and whatever it is they pass for apricots around here are just ridiculous. I bought four apricots at the store. I think they were really pretty, but I'll tell you, they were horrible. Dry, they didn't taste. They were, and apricot jam is my absolute favorite jam and I don't eat much jam, but I do love apricot jam. Anyway, uh, so any of your uh, 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 high acid fruits. Again, get yourself the ball book, look it up online, you can get a used copy, they're really cheap. Um, and there'll be so many recipes you could spend the next, I could spend 15 years cooking out of this book and I use it as, as a reference of how long can I actually make split piece? Can I can split piece soup? Yes, fine. How long, what process? Um, how to do vegetable soup, how to do salsas, how to do, um, uh, all the things that you can use. Citric acid is just a nice tool to have to make absolutely sure. And even with uh, vegetable, even with fruits that you might even feel it, feel any doubt, use some citric acid. It doesn't make a taste. It doesn't, unlike many recipes in the past, used to call for lemon juice or vinegar, both of which added flavor that I am not fond of or don't want to have in, the, in, in whatever it is that I'm making. So citric acid is a very, very useful uh, tool and, and really uh, expensive. So we have a question from Franz Cannon who asked, is the cannery at Coesville still working? The community cannery at Farmville is the one that is working. Coesville, I tell you what,
Thank you. <laughs> Welcome back. And we solved the entire problems of all the worlds while we were on our break, and we're not going to let you know. So you just have to go on. But if there's any more questions, we have about three or four minutes until we're ready to take these jars out of the, out of the can. You could repeat what you said about the Oh, I was asked about how thing, people might have stored things uh, underground or under dirt, and that's called a clamp. And people would, um, in the right kind of climate, they could harvest the cabbages, which they'd keep the big long stem on, uh, otherwise it could spoil. And, the, and even pumpkins, you'd keep that stem on. All the squashes, if you want them to store well, the winter squashes, you want to keep that stem on them. Don't break that, 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 uh, that stem off. And they would uh, turn upside down and they'd put them on piles of, uh, like a pile of dirt, they cover with straw and then they cover more dirt and they could go down in their basement and get, um, and get cabbage through the, uh, through the winter. But again, of course, at some point, I, I don't know how many people, how many of you have ever smelled rotten cabbage, but sooner or later, they would begin to spoil. And you might have to work pretty hard to whack all the rotten parts off to get some good cabbage, but it might be all that you could do. The same with potatoes. Um, you know, did you have a, a cool enough, dry, you know, cool, dry, dark, uh, right humidity place to store potatoes or apples or uh, any of those things? A lot of it had to do with, do you even have access to those things in the first place? I mean, here, it, it's, it's, not that, it's not necessarily that easy to grow potatoes uh, out of its, cool, out of the cooler ranges of states, you know, here, I have to struggle to grow enough potatoes and, um, uh, and I don't grow enough for my own winter use by any means. I just grow them as a treat so that I can have, you know, much of the summer I can enjoy. Once they come in, I, a number of weeks, couple of months or so, I've got, you know, fresh potatoes that I really enjoy and they're gone. And then I buy regular potatoes. Um, but that's the same for most of us. We live in houses or we live in apartments. Or we live in, so we have to be uh, uh, selective and clever about what we decide we want to put our energy into. And one of the things I like about tomatoes and peaches is that it can be a, it doesn't, you don't have to go down to the community can or somebody's got a kitchen and somebody's got some jars and somebody, and you've got some fruit. Three people can do a hell of a lot in a day in terms of cans of peaches. And once you have the jars, you always have them as long as you keep care of them. And I, I save, um, I save the boxes that my jars come in. And when I wash my jars, they're done. I put them upside down in these and I stack them and I store them so they're ready to go right to the dishwasher to be used again. I store all, store and save all my rings, but you have to have new lids every time to can. Now I do save some used lids to use to store dry things in jars just in my pantry shelf. Just, you know, just, but not, you cannot use them again to can, they cannot be safe. So all you've got to do every year is just buy new lids. And you've got a collection of rings that slowly accumulates and you got a collection of jars that slowly, slowly accumulates. And so you can, uh, you know, a group of people can get together and really, put some food out for you, you know, in a, in a day. It's really, I mean, I know I've canned easily 50 or 60 jars of peaches by myself in one day, and easily if they've been, well, could you just start at the beginning and do it all the way through, and take a little break, and the lunch, then go back and do it, and it's nighttime, you know what I mean, and then you're done. But there's that, if you had, um, hell, I, I used to do this because I was on the farm by myself, and I didn't have any siblings, and I didn't, Two babies at home, and I, everybody that I knew that that uh, that did that kind of stuff all lived 50 miles away, and they were milking cows too, so they couldn't come and help. So we just all did it ourselves. But now we've got, you know, I could call eight people if I wanted to come over, help me can, and it'd be done. And then the laugh, I'll tell you, there's nothing quite as funny as all day putting stuff in jars. Jeff just had a clear time question. Can you repeat what you mentioned about the lid? Um, just for clarity, were you saying you can only use the lid once for cleaning? Yeah. This is the lid. You can use this one time to can 
once it's sealed, it'll make a, a, a indentation around the, the, the ring and it'll never really seal, it it'll, won't seal again. So this is, the, this is the lid that you have to buy. And I buy them in bulk. I try to buy ball because they're the best, the best brand. You can buy them in sleeves, big bond band. And sometimes you have to, uh, I don't know, go knock somebody down in Southern States because they got the last box, and, you know. But remember, whenever you buy brand new jars, they all come with new rings and lids on them, ready to go. Okay, so that you're kind of ahead. So if you buy yourself, um, uh, you know, enough jars. So at least start yourself and then start accumulating uh, extra lids for uh, when you're working on when you're at home, when you're reusing your jars. And you can reuse these jars. Now you're going to be um, thoughtful. They're tempered glass. They're beautiful quality. But you might want to every once in a while, maybe as you're washing them, when you finally get ready to put them away, just run your finger around and check there's no nick. Check there's no little hairline thing, bam, put it away, you got it, okay? Because every once in a while, there is gonna be an imperfection. And one of them, usually it's gonna, you're gonna hear the crack and the goddamn bottom's gonna fall out of it. And why are you gonna swear? And you think I already swear, you're gonna really hear me swear. Um, when that happens. Now, because I don't assume I did something wrong, I usually assume it, and it happens not even, every year, but when it happens, it's annoying. If it did happen, you would leave, you would finish the processing time for the rest of the jars, and then you would bring them in. Uh, you know, you would, you would uh, then you throw all that water away and imagine throwing all that water away when you have to. When I lived on a farm, I pumped my water. I hand pumped water, five gallon pail. And 20 gallons a day came into my house. And if you couldn't do it, 20 gallons, it did not get done. And so I know about water. And I know about how dear it is. So when I want us to think not only about what we're doing and what our opportunities are, whether it's a group in an aggregate, a beautiful kitchen like this in our own small kitchens at home, but to really expand our vision out into the world. What are other households? What are in other, in other situations? We hear about people who don't have water and they don't have, uh, or they don't have adequate food. Well, then sometimes that means they don't have adequate water. How are they washing the food that they're eating? How are they washing their hands before they touch their food and use their food? No wonder they have pink eye and other kinds of things. So we need to be thinking about that, never letting that, it doesn't have to obsess us. We don't have to wake up in the middle of the night and we, we do have to have an active sense of. If there is a thing that we can do or promote that would help the people who live in the world that don't have water, that don't have access to decent, uh, decent cooking situations, that don't have access to fuel and firewood, how can we be part of the solution for that? Because it's going to come from all of us, no matter how unprivileged many of us are. We are most of us, the vast majority of us, far more privileged than the least privilege in the developing world. So that's kind of my lecture for the day. You don't have to write a 250 word essay. I'm assuming that you all got that message. Let's get these damn jars out. Now, with any canner, remember, it's all hot. It's all dangerous. Get your kids out of the kitchen, move that damn dog. Don't let anybody be there because they don't need, they, nobody needs to get hurt. And almost all of them have a rack that hooks onto the side of the canner. All of them. And that's a safety feature that's just really incredible so that you can lift these jars up out of that water safely. I, now comes our magic little, our little thing that we thought we didn't know what the hell it was, is I'm going to take it, and you see this, the, the rim of the glass right there? 
I'm aiming to be under that rim and holding it and pulling it up, and swinging it over just like a crane, holding it nice and tight, swinging it over. Right here. That's if I don't got too tight. I take them out in opposite so that the um, rack doesn't tilt, kind of the same way that I put them in. I'm going to space them an inch or two apart. I usually use a dishcloth to put them on because that's. Oh my God, did you scare the hell out of me? Woo! It's about to jump down my skin. Huh? Nothing's popped yet, so the jars have this. And I don't know if we can get at the right angle to show that the lids are still convex, right? That's convex. They're still convex. And as they cool, it'll seal. And when it seals, it'll go pop. And this inner seal here, right here, will, will pop down, which is why you don't touch them. Do not touch any of these lids upon pain of death. You tell your children if they touch one of these, you won't be saying here. Only because I got an email from somebody whose mother in law thought she was doing a wonderful thing and happened to see, was looking at the jars and saw and managed to touch the one that then it did the press and it seemed like it was sealed, but it made the tanner real worried because she wasn't sure which one it was. The mother in law couldn't remember which one it was and she should have kept her damn hands off of it anyway. And um, so you don't, you just, you want to let, let it cool at its own, at its own speed. And we don't have time this evening probably to let it do that, but I hope we'll get one, it would be nice to have one of them pop while we're here. So Lenny, we did have another question okay. from Franz Cannon, um, related to the lid discussion we had mm -hmm. right before taking these out. If the lip of the jar is slightly chipped, must it be discarded? Could you smooth the chip out with a diamond file? No, as in the large end and the large, no, from me, don't do it. I'll spank you. Okay. Throw that in jar. Nothing is worse than having, first of all, it's annoying to have things break and you can it. They can break all the rest of the jars that are in the can, but a little loss out. Um, if it didn't show up right away and thought that it sealed, two weeks later that could break the seal. And then you got a spoiled jar of whatever it is that you have. These, the, the, the temper of this glass is why Ball and Mason are such high quality, is that they're the people who really perfected this beautiful tempering of the glass. I don't even advise using really old or antique jars for canning. Now they're good for, we're gonna make refrigerator pickles. You're gonna just um, store your sauerkraut in that, in the refrigerator or, or any kind of dry use that you're gonna do, fine. You know, but it's hard to remember which or who. So as, as, as sad as it might make you, if you see a jar that is, imper that, that is imperfect, Either mark it with a big marker, so you know, right across the chip or something, or better yet, just throw it out. Just if you, you want to be safe. You want to be safe. You want anybody that eats your food to be safe. You don't hear as much about it these days, but I have a feeling maybe we might if, we, if, if canning continues to be the something that a lot of newbies are just starting to do, uh, especially when it comes to pressure canning, you know, we're gonna have to be really leery about people who are you know, arriving with their can, whatever, at the potluck. You know, whether or not you want to take a chance on eating Mildred's three bean salad. That's, uh, and I'll tell you how I do this. I'm just gonna let y'all know and that way you can just dun me with emails. I'm so leery of other people. And I know that somebody lets their cats on their kitchen counter 
I wouldn't eat their food if I was starving to death. I'd eat a snake first, I'll tell you. And when they arrive at the potluck, I make sure that I go in the kitchen wherever the food is, and I just hip check that thing right off onto the floor. <gasps> oh, Louise, I am so sorry. My God, what can I do to make up for it? Oh, gee, ain't nobody needs to eat their food. If they got a cat on the kitchen counter, don't eat their food. In fact, turn them into the SPCA. Because we don't want to, taxoplasmosis is a real, actual disease that injures pregnant women and unborn babies, which is why pregnant women are not encouraged or uh, allowed to change cat, um, cat boxes. Is because, and cats can't help it. They're lovely animals. I got a cat, but they can't help it. Their, their, their feet are covered because of the way um, they, they do. Um, and we, they mustn't be on our food serving surfaces. And if you cannot discipline your cat not to do that, then you need to get rid of your damn cat. You can train a cat, but you, then you actually you actually have to train the cat to do it. A um, squirt bottle is really handy. Swatting them with the newspaper can be helpful. Um, I always used, uh, at our house, it's called the uh-uh. All my kids were trained with the uh-uh. They knew they were heading towards something that they were not supposed to do, whatever it was. Uh-uh. <laughs> I don't know where I got that. I think I maybe got it from my grandma. But you knew that you were on your way to something very serious if you got that. And the cats will learn it. And I had finally, you know, I had a cat that would literally sit on the floor. I, to this day, I got a cat. You know, we're eating dinner outside. He doesn't even eat people. For food. He, you know, he might sit on the ground and look at you, but he wouldn't eat the food if you offered it to him, which is really nice. And, um, yeah, but mostly it is a hygiene problem. We, we don't want our pets on our cooking services. They, there's no, um, we wouldn't let our, we wouldn't bring our two-year-old from the street who's been walking on, the, walking on the sidewalk where people let their dog shit and then put them up on the counter and let them walk around in their shoes and then cut a sandwich right on there, would we? And if we did, we need to be disciplined. We need some home training. You know what I mean? Because the floor and the outsides are dirty. And I don't really talk much. I raise chickens. You know what I mean? I live on a farm. I mean, and I'm not really that excited about dirt much of the time. But there are certain things that are really dirty and you need to watch it. And that's one of them. So that's lecture, lecture number two. And you don't have to write an essay about that either. Um, but I figure I'm old enough to tell you all that. I was just 80 last week. So I didn't say that. Thank you. They landed on, well, not last week, maybe it was three weeks ago, whatever it was. They landed on, I landed on the moon on my birthday, which was one of the best birthday presents I ever got. I was 27 years old. It was fantastic. Can you imagine having the moon landing on your birthday? Oh, oh yeah, it was really, yeah, you'll never forget. And I've met a number of other, you know, July 20 uh, uh, birthday people, and we all get to have that little cachet. <laughs> But I was, I'm a, of that generation that actually watched it happen on television. Yeah. So here we have our jars. Um, and I'm trying to see, I think that, I think this one may have sealed. This one isn't. You see a little rise in the, in the, in the top there. I think this one might actually seal. They don't always pop. I've had them come out where you lift the thing and it's a pop, 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 pop. And then I've had them where it just sits and then by the next morning they're all seated. So they're just fine. So we are going to, we're going to leave these right here overnight. And tomorrow morning, one of these fine ladies here at this lovely kitchen. This is the most lovely kitchen to work in. And this is so, it's a lovely, convenient, full of good stuff and good people too. But, um, and that stove, huh? that thing really cooks, um, is they're gonna come in, they're gonna uh, test that it's just room temperature, they're gonna untwist, half the time the ring will just go right, because it's, it's uh, contracted, the, the lids have contracted a bit and the rings have expanded. And they're gonna take these rings off, they're gonna take a, uh, maybe a dish towel with a little warm water, although these aren't very sticky, sometimes they're sticky. And you might just kind of wipe it off a bit. And at that point, they're going to write 
the date and what's in it, and then they can put it somewhere nice. Share it. So we have a quick question. Um, how long will these last after they've been sealed? How long can we keep them before using? Oh, we can eat them tomorrow, or we can eat them three years from now. We might even eat them five years from now. It depends on how slack you are about the shelf that you've got your camp goods on. But uh, without making too much fun, you want to try, if you can, to use up your canned goods. Don't make so many canned goods that you can't use them up, which is the other reason I believe sharing is so really wonderful. Is that if you've got a, if you can figure out between all of you and, and two other people, gee, you know, I use, uh, uh, I don't know, I use 12 quarts of tomatoes, uh, you know, hunts those big uh, cans of tomatoes uh, a year, you know, a, a winter time. I, I pretty much know that. Well, then you, you need at least 12 quarts of tomatoes, maybe more. Go to, go to 15, go to 20, because you'll probably use more because they taste so good and they're yours. But you don't have to go to 50 if you only use 12 or 15. Uh, or go to 50 and give half of them away. You see what I mean? We can, we can make those kind of deals. If you find you love to make jam, Hell, make all the jam you want and then give it away to people or share with other people or sell it. Or, But mostly, I believe in giving it away because it's good for you to do that, especially for me because I don't go to church. So I think that's my little tithes. But uh, regardless, don't make more than you need. You don't need to be greedy about this. Uh, make some this year if you discover Wow, you know, it's the end of January and I've used up all my tomatoes. Well, that's a good indication. Maybe next year you'll do twice as many tomatoes. Okay, but start slow. You don't need to, you know, you're not, you're not, uh, it's in the contest. And you can still always go and buy perfectly decent tomatoes at the store. Uh, although I understand in places like California that uh, a lot of places that are having drought, you know, tomatoes are at a premium. So, you know, depending on where you are, but regardless, we need to try to not be greedy about it, whatever it is, and to share it, to use it, and try to use it up in a, uh, uh, in a, in a, in a, in a consistent manner. Start at the front, put all your older stuff at the back, make sure that, you know, once a week or however that is, that you're using those tomatoes, you're eating those peaches. They're not, they're, they're not heirlooms. You're, saving them for your grandchild. You want to eat them so that next year you can make more or do more uh, and, and, and have them. And, and that way you get into the habit of creating that, uh, uh, you know, the back of it, uh, the back lawn. So does that answer what, what do you think? Like I said, ball, ball says 18 months. That's not a bad thing to aim for, is if you have used everything you had that you did this, this summer by 18 months, that means that next month, next year, you can do the same amount next year and still use up, do you see what I mean? You're always ahead, you're always ahead. So when you think about, uh, and that's when it comes to like making too many pickles, you gotta really decide how many pickles y'all actually eat. You know, because it becomes there's so many cucumbers if you grow, especially if you have a garden and you grow your own. There comes a point, and I keep telling people, when you have the 11 jars of pickles that you know that that's all you're going to eat, pull them down, plant some. Don't be asking everybody, oh, y'all want some pickles? No, I don't want pickles. I got pickles of my own. You know what I mean? It's like having people ask you, I've got a rooster and I he needs a forever home. Who do they think? you know, needs a rooster. All of us people who have chickens, we either have a rooster or we don't want a rooster. And if we, you know, out in the country, just because we live in the country doesn't mean we want a rooster. You give me that rooster, I'm going to eat it. You know what I mean? Because I, I don't keep a rooster. Anyway, so it's kind of that, that uh, if to lose some of those illusions, those uh, kind of fancy illusions about, about food. Can I thank everybody? Everybody, thank you. Thank you for your patience. Thank you for your attention. 